Um, uh, so I made some slides, um, and you see the book here. It's all of its all of the real copies, and this is why we're here. Um, I wanted to start with an image of the book because I realize um, that I use it kind of in multiple ways, um, and I think it's kind of ha <laughs> it has a, a great multiple life to it. it. It's kind of a source book in a way um, with all the dances that they collaborated on, um, as well as that Paul Taylor and Alex Katz collaborated on, as well as the other collaborations that Katz took on. But it's also an exhibition catalog and a work of scholarship, so it has this multiple life to it that these ribbons, these beautiful ribbons, kind of allow you to read it in, in different ways, kind of like a, a great source book. Um, but we're also um, gathered here on the occasion of this fantastic exhibition at Colby. Um, yeah, congrats on uh, Mazel Tov for that. It's an amazing show. I'll just show some images that there might be a little too small that maybe you can see. And it pairs, as you can tell, um, paintings um, and works of visual art um, by Katz alone with some of the collaborations, films, um, projected images, prop, uh, reconstructions of props or stage settings that Katz um, designed that are then kind of displayed in the museum alongside the paintings and cutouts as well as with um, sketches and studies. Um, and uh, both the book and the exhibition, I noticed, here's another view, and you can see the great columns from the last book, which Michael and I have promised each other we'll talk a lot about today. It's one of our faves. <laughs> um, but um, both the exhibition and the book, if you notice, the opening room of the exhibition has this fantastic photograph or self-portrait really a portrait of um Scott Alex. Scott. Scott. Right. yeah right and, and he's sort of portraying himself amongst the dancers right and using the, the scale of the painting to sort of show himself as a painter in the company of dancers as it were right i mean and probably not the first to use that phrase it's so perfect um but you see the kind of artist he's fashioning for himself or performing for us here, that is a painter with his painting, right? But with dancers making painterly gestures with and alongside the gestures of dancers, right? And this is the kind of artist I think that the exhibition in the book shows us. Um, someone who uh, saw always the body and the image and surface as always kind of braided together Right? And he performs that for us in this, in this image. And I just wanted to start there. It's also a fabulous portrait. Um, and uh, I wanted to just say a couple of things before we open it up. I mean, I, I warned you that I'm a nerdy art historian and I feel like I need like context and then we'll start talking. I'm a nerdy dance historian, yeah, 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 yeah. so we're good. <laughs> Our powers just, to, just interrupt me too. <laughs> like, but um, one thing I think we could say about at least Katz and, and his interaction with Taylor is that it shows us, and we may end up focusing on the, on the early collaborations, although we definitely want to talk about some of the later ones as well, um, but you see Katz emerging at this crucial, as an artist, at this crucial moment in which a very sort of, I should say, I don't want to generalize, but I should say a kind of painterly culture of the 50s focused on questions of what is, you know, specific or autonomous or is, is privileged about painting itself to a more multidisciplinary, multimedia world of the 60s. And Katz sort of is hinged right in that moment in a way that for me as an art historian is extremely provocative and makes, puts pressure on the, his, the art history that I'm a comp, you know, have been taught really. He, he's a dancer, or sorry, a figure who sees who on the one hand is a super disciplined painter, and he talks a lot in many of his interviews about the skills of the painter, the technical skills of the painter, and he's constantly honing these skills over a whole life. And at the same time, he's always seeing painting or positioning painting amongst the other disciplines like dance. And I just wanted to foreground that um, at the, the outset. Um, he sees painting within a larger context of images, surfaces, spaces, gestures, 
that might be a pop approach, right? Um, but it also might be like a dancer lead approach or something like that too. So I, I just wanted to lay those terms out. Hopefully that's somewhat clear. I mean, and, and we can start from there. It leads me to my first question, I think. Um, in, in your experience, um, maybe speaking, I don't know, with, with, with whichever hat you'd like to put on, like, have you found, um, in, the, in your experience of cross-disciplinary collaboration, have you found the experience of sort of butting up against um, other practitioners, painters, sculptors, or whatever it might be, has that helped you think about your own chosen field? Has it changed your own approach? Has it expanded it? Um, there's a famous quote from, from uh, I think it's Taylor, and we'll get to it in a second, but I'll, I'll start there. Yeah, yeah. I would say that um, a lot of things you just said, y yes, um, there are parallels. I think what, what was happening in visual art at the time and what was happening in dance, um, dance was asking very big questions in the 1950s about like what is movement, what is dance, um, what are found objects, um, and in the dance world found objects are gestures, poses, sitting, standing, you know, how far away can we extract dancerly things to reveal humanity? Um, so dance is kind of exploring this through a very different lens. Um, but in terms of interdisciplinary collaborations, I think the poignancy, and this is kind of prevalent within most of dance history, and I'm speaking of dance history within the Western European lens largely, but um, collaborations between music, um, design, or visual art, choreography, um, a libretto sometimes, um, it really is a, uh, a synthesis of all these things coming together that can create truly, if it's done well, um, truly transformative art. And I think the power of, interdis of, the power of interdisciplinary collaborations as a performer is that it is the movement, but more so that the lighting, the music, the costumes you're wearing, the set, the world that you're in can transform how you perform and what your impulses are as a person who's embodying movement. Um, which I think is a good thing that like an artist whose primary function is to move as their primary source of expression that like, if the lighting is bright or dark, if the space is small or large, or if there are objects in the way that like it, sh you should, on like an atomic level, adjust to how you're performing. Or, and sometimes it's in contrast too. Um, and with Alex Katz specifically, and the incredible Jennifer Tipton who is here tonight, with Paul Taylor, um, this collaboration of visual art and lighting with music and Paul, produced universes on stage that are transformative for the audience, but are also incredibly transformative as a performer to be in them. I like to think that if you like Alex Katz's paintings or his work, and you can stare at them for a while and you wonder about his use of color or flat, his flatness where the humanity is there and where it's absent, um, whether there's abstraction or not, being in a cat's work rather than just seeing it is an incredible gift um, and one that I treasure dearly and I know our dancers do as well. I, I love the way you speak about it as a being in the world, a, a different world that's created yes. and that you include the spectator in that world. It's not just the dancers or the objects on stage. I think if art does its, or if theater does its job, the curtain goes up and everyone in that building at that moment is transported in some capacity. Um, it's not always comfortable or beautiful. Sometimes it is stark and uncomfortable, but I think the goal is that that curtain opens up an opportunity for us to be transformed um, on both sides of the curtain. You know, that reminds me um, of uh, a, a quotation that from Paul Taylor's autobiography. Um, about, um, he's it's in the first pages of the book, and he says something like, um, uh, it really changed my thinking, by the way, of the, of the Katz-Taylor collaboration, but it made me 
see the Taylor works on their own differently too, where he says something, he's talking about his childhood and he was given a, a gift of a little mini proscenium stage um, by someone. And he was playing with it on his bed or something. And he says like, in this fantasy world I had created, the, the, a, like, a, like, a, like a primal thing had, had been enacted. A, pr a proscenium stage had been stamped in my brain, he says, and, and it would swing back and forth between a private and a public domain. I just love that. I, I, I've always pondered that quotation. It's so, it's, it's so rich. I don't, I can't really decipher it. I've tried, you know, but. Well, I think, I think um, what's great for people to know is that Paul Taylor was a painter first. Um, then he was a swimmer, and then he happened to become one of the greatest choreographers in dance history. But um, he often references, there's a very famous poet who talks about like, those first couple impressions that you have in your life, the first things that kind of imprint on you. And I think the frame or the yeah, proscenium, right. yeah. for Paul, he, he created, he painted for the frame, and he created dances for the frame, which is the proscenium. And as, as his career matured over time, the frame grew because of his popularity, the size of the company grew. So you see this maturation um, in terms of stagecraft from a choreographic perspective, but also the collaborators that he worked with over the decades, that also expanded. So their lens about how the work could grow and shrink. Um, but the proscenium is the frame for which the art is experienced. Yeah, I, I hope we can keep that in our thoughts as we go forward, because I think you're absolutely right that that sort of initial condition of the proscenium, of the frame, right? The frame is a better word, thank you, because it also applies to painting and, and all of the works of art, that there's always a framework and you can't just swipe it away, but have that in place and then experiment with that. Um, but it will, I think we'll see that in the collaborations, which let's, let's, let's go. Alex liked playing with frame too. He yeah, right? Liked, he, yeah. he liked distorting what your perspective was of space in a way. Yeah. I meant to talk about this or have this in the background when I was talking about 50s, 60s. I mean, this is the milieu, right? And, and this is, this is the, the constellation in which Katz and Taylor are, are thinking and working. But let's start here. Um, yeah, right? I mean, this is probably the first Paul Taylor dance I saw. Um, and I always sort of grouped it with um, uh, Post Meridian. Um, maybe because I'm being yeah, maybe because I'm just, I was more looking at the cat's collab part of this <laughs> um, and thinking about what do those, those, that costuming, what does that do to the body, you know? Um, and and, and, and yeah. I mean that in a good way, like, and I always seem to think of it as, okay, it's about fragmenting the body, dissecting it in a way in order to put it back together in new types of configurations with other bodies. Does that, do you jive with that reading, or is that, do, that's how I've seen it. I think, and, I've, and I know in the book, Alex actually talks about this, about the, this, um, this notion of color moving, that when you create something on a flat painting, you're actually looking at, that's the color and that's it. But the idea of putting color on a three-dimensional body and that body turning. So if you go back to Junction for a second, and Junction, um, the subtitle for Junction, um, is the junction um, of tranquility and fervor. And Paul is, it's kind of a microcosm truly of like Paul's movement vocabulary of moments of incredible stillness that would, you might consider flat, more like a painting. And then fervor of incredible speed and virtuosity where the blur of colors creates a different visual impact. Um, and in this movement style, specifically from junction, um, Paul is inspired, um, it's to the Bach cello suites, and Paul is inspired by the um, movement of the cellist's hand on the bow. And this idea of scribbling is what Paul called it, um, where you've kind of taken away, there's, there's form and structure, but it's this completely loose, open-ended, ribbon-like effect of how the body moves. Um, so to have that compared to the Bach cello suites, with these colors that when the bodies are moving, um, it is this like whiplash um, physically and visually. Um, what's interesting about Post Meridian, I think, Post Meridian comes out of a dance that they had actually collaborated on earlier called the Red Room. And the Red Room was made for this for the Spleto Festival a couple of years earlier. And 
Alex built a stage that was terracotta colored uh, floor and walls. It was a closed room and they performed it at Spoleto and it was too expensive to ship back to the US. So the set was, it went by. Um, and when they came back to the United States, Paul reimagined it into Post Meridian. Um, so these costumes are not original to the original choreography, although the choreography, I would have to do a comparison of how much of it is actually intact. Um, but this idea of fragmenting the body and then what that does visually um, to form. And in this case with Post Meridian, you do have a black background, whereas in Junction, you have a white background with these red little ribbons. Um, which are easy to transport as opposed, as opposed to a theater that's covered in this terracotta colored wall and floor. Um, but this notion of color and how it moves and how it changes your eye and where Paul sits within that, I think is a fascinating entry point. I, I think you actually have a better way of talking. I, I, it's maybe not, I like what you said, it's almost like the body is, de it kind of becomes this dematerialized color thing when it's spinning and moving, it, it, it flashes, as you said, or something, yeah. ribbons. Yeah. It does, and where Paul's genius, I think, steps in is that it doesn't lose its humanity. Right. It is different from Cunningham at the time, who was working with Merce Cage and Robert Rauschenberg a lot, where they're, um, the phrase we use in dance history is the aesthetic of indifference, um, where there is a devoid, there's an absence of emotion. There's intention, but it's, 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 it's removed or distant. And Paul's work, even the abstraction of it still has an element of humanity that's different from Merce. Um, that gets it kind of expanded upon as he gets further along his career. But even here, in the abstraction, there is the, there are these elements, there are these gestures that are incredibly human, yeah. just like Katz's paintings. Yeah. yeah, I guess that, that is a, we should keep that in place, this tension of that, I mean, I think maybe what Katz is learning is that dance can be a place for reimagining the body in, in, as something that is, or I should say, not individual, but is like with other bodies, made up of other bodies, you know? Um, anyway, well, well, let's return to that. Um, I um, <coughs> wanted to at least show you this, the color version. By the way, all these images I've basically taken from the book. These are all in the book and much better reproductions there, so you can get a taste of what you would see if you bought the book. Um, One of my favorite dances. I know, and, and something about this painting speaks to what you were saying, Michael, that it's hard to see one body on its own here. They're always in com combination with others and flowing and moving between others in this way where it's like a collective body rather than individuals or something like that. Well, I think the use of color, especially yeah. bright colors like that, and it's funny, when we performed this work, we just did it at Lincoln Center in 2022, and um, it's, I, it's an extraordinary work from 1963, um, to the music of Clarence Jackson, um, which was a kind of a, it was originally choreographed to uh, uh, Stravinsky's Socrates um, and then Paul brought Clarence Jackson in to kind of do like this jazz reimagining of an original score. Um, the notion of color as connected to archetypes and characters is fascinating. Um, I don't quite know the origins of these colors. I don't know if Paul or Alex did. Um, and there may be a lens there, but audiences, it's funny, color becomes, what, what does the man in purple, like what, why purple? What does purple send us? What signal does it give us? What feeling does it give us? The woman in red, the woman in yellow, the man in green, like there's this, like the notion that color can actually inform layers of how we perceive art, I think is fascinating throughout their collaboration. Yeah, do, do you think that the color is relational? Like the, the purple man changes his meaning based on his relationship to other, the other bodies through it. You know what I mean? It's like, there's not like a purple one set meaning, but it's shifting the bodies. Well, let's explore that. Yeah. I, I, I guess we should think about color further. That is, that is, but before we, oh, orbs. I um, wanted to hear what you hear, hear more about this work. Yeah. Uh, this is one that I, I, to be quite frank, know not so much about. And I know about the cat side of the equation. What fascinated me was 
a theme that I saw consistently propping up in Katz's work, but also in his collaborations with Taylor, of the double, of the du of doubling, of mm. the ways in which um, the way in which that concept flows through dance and painting in a way that can be productive, or maybe we should we'll explore that. But that's how I understood this. But I, I'm, one, I'm curious from a dancer's perspective, or from so orbs, um, as you can see. Um, this is a photo from 1966, which I believe is the year it premiered in 1965, um, and it's one of Paul's lar larger and longer works. Um, it's two acts that run about 60 minutes total, um, and there's four different sections, and each each section represents a season, and it's performed to Beethoven's late quartets. And three of the seasons happen in the ethereal plane among the gods, and then one of them happens down on, on the human realm, and it's this. It's this, it's more abstract than that in, in terms of the arc, but this notion of what happens above also happens below in the influence. And you have characters who play both gods and humans, um, which actually connects to a larger theme that is in their collaboration of um, pedestrian attire, to, like, to kind of relate to the common individual relative to like the unitards and like the more elaborate costumes and skirts, which you, which you have with the women here, um, who have these fabulous rainbow um, skirts that run between the two legs. Um, but it's, a, it's an extraordinary complex work. The lighting by Jennifer Tipton is astounding. Um, and it's, I think it cemented their trust in each other to create something that could have that weight and suspend time for that long. Junction, I think, is a relatively short work. I think it's around 11 minutes. Post meridian is a little bit longer, probably closer to 18 or 20. But to do 60 minutes and to create like a visual arc, um, and the choreographic one as well to beautiful music, um, was extraordinary. You, you mentioned that it cemented their trust or something. I think it's one of the works that definitely, yeah. yeah. It, it, I think it was a major stepping stone in the collaboration, yeah. certainly. We know that quote from, um, actually, I think it's from Paul Taylor. It, could, it might be mis. I think it, he said it, right? That, or was it? Yeah, that that cats makes obstacles for me, right? What, our collaboration is about yes. making obstacles. I know that's like we'll often get to used, obstacle. Yeah, that's <laughs> often. No, I know. And yes. We'll see dignity and other things, but like. I think that quotation has been seen as one lens to see the collaboration, right? About placing obstacles for the other to respond to. And then it's a kind of, I don't want to say antagonistic dialogue, but it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a collaboration based on sort of, I don't know, not conflict, that seems too hard. Mischievous. Yeah, yeah, but like kind mischief. of tension or something that's productive. I mean it in the generative sense. And um, whenever I think of collaboration in those terms, I'm reminded of, Actually, a critic who recognized Katz's, uh, the importance of Katz's work quite early on, Lawrence Alloway, who was also a Guggenheim curator, um, invented this term called antagonistic cooperation to describe certain types of collaboration where it's not just sweet, happy collaboration, but there's antagonism within every dialogue, even with the, our most intimate um, relationships, there's antagonism. And it's about foregrounding that and using that. Um, do you buy that as a, as a way to think about their collaboration? Did it have moments of that kind of antagonism? Oh my God, of course it okay. did. Yes. Yeah. yes, it did. I mean, they both talk about yeah. it. Yeah. yeah, no, there's a definite, um, I think the New York Times article that just came out a couple of months ago, um, it's like, it's like, oh, I'll show you. And it's this sense of like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a bigger obstacle. I'm going to choreograph around it even more. Well, I'm gonna change this relationship to what the whole proscenium means. Well, I'll choreograph around that, you know? I don't know if it was that verbal either. I think it was a lot of, you know, like, oh, okay. Like, I can see Paul being like, okay, well, okay, that's what you want to do. Uh, so it's like, and then I'll work around it. But it's like were, imagining what the other person is trying to make me do. Yeah. And there was listening as well, like, we'll get to Sunset, but there, but it's this beautiful work um, to Elgar and Loon, uh, and a soundtrack of Loon Calls. And Alex's idea was the Loon Calls, and to do the entire piece to Loons. and. Paul tried it, and it ended up not working, and Paul decided to combine the two, so it was Elgar and the Loon. So there's also this sense of like, 
um, Lost Found Lost, which we can get to, was Alex's idea to use elevator music. And Paul said, absolutely not, under no circumstances am I choreographing a dance to music that I hate. Yeah. And we have Lost Found and Lost, which is choreographed to elevator music. <laughs> so there's this, there's this challenging of each other. And I think they're very healthy egos yeah. that liked that yeah. and trusted each other through that. Yeah, which is also interesting. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, uh, I can check that clicker. Oh, okay, yes. Of Speaking of the frame. Speaking of frames and obstacles. Um, exactly, the frame. I mean, you, you can explain this better than I can, um, but uh, maybe I'll let you start off with yeah. that, and then and I can talk about the painting. Yeah. Um, so Alex writes um, in the book that you're all gonna buy um, that through the window in his apartment, he could only see half stories of what was happening um, in the apartment across the way, and this notion of what you see and what you don't see. So this rear window yeah. element um, inspired Alex, and he went to Paul, and basically the idea was, what if we created four panels that hung downstage, which is close to the audience, so it blocks your view, so that every person in the theater is seeing a different version of the story. You can see the same dance performed five, six, seven times in different places in the theater, right. and you're getting a different narrative. Um, and Paul said yes, and then I think Alex also quotes Paul as that the idea from underwear for this was that Paul had said something to the effect of like, well, I've been to parties where Everyone's wearing underwear, so let's do that. And Alex designed what he designed. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I think this work is a it's a it's a hinge for all those ways you you just described it. The the the, the notion, right, that it's the frame that decides the reception of the work, right? It's not in the dance or in the artwork itself, but the framing is what conditions the meaning and reception of the work by the spectator. Or the it's author. funny that Alex's painting doesn't right. do yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like he has this amazing idea, and he gives it to Paul, and then he makes this gorgeous, huge painting that's probably, I mean, it's larger than this television. It's massive, yeah, it's like yeah. a wall. And then doesn't actually put those barriers up. <laughs> but it's a really good point. I know, I, whenever I look at this painting, um, uh, or think about this painting and others, what, what I see is, this the the body body the body being fragmented and put back together in these new kind of extra human assembly assemblies. Do you know what I mean? That don't really work, but only dance allows that to happen for a moment, and then it goes. Do you know what I mean? And so he's trying to sort of capture that. In the, I mean, but you're right. The framing maybe the frame. It's you know it's um, or it's the frame of the painting. Exactly. Yeah. That, right. And so, but um, that's a very good point. Um, and uh, man, the way he paints the bodies there, it's pretty wonderful. Um, in any case, uh, yeah, okay, moving right along. Oh, okay, so before we left the 60s, um, I needed to at least say a couple things about the non, the non-dance, the, the theater designs that Alex Katz took on that um, weren't dance focused or weren't dance collaborations at all like um, the set design for um, George Washington Crossing the Delaware, very famous um, work by Katz by now, or, yeah, and you see him there posing, really adorable picture, I love it. Um, I'll say more about these in a second. Um, I wanted to show this work also to bring out a question that I've had, and I'm sure many of you who've seen Alex Katz's work have wondered about like what is the relationship between the cutout works, right, mm -hmm. and and the and the collaborations in dance and theater. I always saw it as coming out of the theater and dance, but then I've heard I think Alex himself talk about it coming out of his portrait work. But it must have fed in, um, to to them, and, and um, I just wanted to show an example of one cutout from Frank O'Hara from the um, Guggenheim show. Um, that also does a different thing. I haven't thought about it until just now, but you made me think about it. I'm like, oh, the frame, right? Like, where is the frame and the cutouts? It's, it's probably in that moment when you walk around and the image disappears and you just see, yeah, right? That's the frame. And then you move around again and you see the image again, right? 
that's probably the frame, right? Or something like that. I think that's a great, that's a question over a bottle of wine. Because yeah, I yeah, think yeah. like, no matter <laughs> what room, because the room becomes the frame. And even the lighting here, yeah, right. yeah. like depending on how it's lit, you know, is the frame the edge of the actual cutout? Or right. is right. how the silhouette is framed? Wonderful. And what, yeah. so shadow, as it relates to object, I think is another lens to that. And, and to, to add on to that, that's so amazing. But it's just perfect here. Is this a pair? Oh, no, I thought that was a laser pointer. Art historians really want their laser pointers. Um, the double and the frame are kind of concepts that go together in Katz's work, I think, in some way. That is kind of hard to articulate, but if they're there, um, and you see the great um, Ada portrait there. Uh, anywho, moving right along. Oh yeah, I wanted, before we left the 60s, to say something about another work that, I wanted to bring this in because honestly, it's one of the works that weirded me out, and I mean that as a high compliment when I say something's weird. Um, shopping and waiting, or the backdrop that Katz painted for Schuyler's Shopping and Waiting um, in 1964, a play that I only read last week in preparation for our talk. Never heard of it or read it. Um, it's a very short play. It's extremely weird, creepy play like the backdrop. Um, it takes place in a store, um, shoppers and wait, people waiting. Um, and what happens in the store, um, it, it, it moves from a banal scene of consumption to a catastrophic scene of trauma and <laughs> Paul would have loved it. And spectacle of some kind. It's a very kind of pop sort of vibe to it, but also, um, you can see it, it's, it's a world in which the objects we consume, the images we consume in our very bodies become kind of merge and new creatures are born in some way and we can see them there. But I wanted to just say that, to at least show you all some of the other collaborations and then to say that, um, yeah, Laura, Loren and I were talking about, what is Kevin gonna say about this? Well, um, I always thought that Kat's, um, was a painter who saw his type of modernism within a long view. Um, I'm probably not the first to say that. Um, and I have thought about his work in relationship to Seurat before. Both of them, I think, think about what is happening to the body in a new age of consumption, in a new age of fast images that are reflecting and merging with our bodies on the street, in the cinema, in the TV, et cetera. And for me, this is the comparison I just wanted to show. I don't know if Alex ever, he must have seen this painting at the Met. It's one of our faves. But the creepiness of the Seurat picture where the great carnival leader, the circus performer, this elven creature, it's really kind of humanoid, not quite human anymore, um, leading us in some sort of dance and we don't know why and for what purpose. And that is something, I just that sinister side of the Taylor Katz world I wanted to keep, because we're going to talk about last little Well, there's also yeah. a cutting off of the form, which I yeah. think is interesting that, you know, you look at private domain with this like notion of like, we're, you're not going to be able to see everything. Um, and even the cover of the book is yeah, a, yeah. an actual rep representation of what is not seen. And I think the Seurat painting actually like also has this notion of what's beyond where he chose to stop. Right. And, and, the, and the frame and the proscenium are fused, right? See, they would love that. Um, Moving along. <laughs> so here we go. Um, I just want to say to you, Michael, that I saw this dance in at Lincoln Center last season, and it was an absolutely it's beautiful, work. important experience in my life. I just want you to know that. Um, and uh, I thought a lot about this dance and the set design before seeing it, but seeing it changed my thinking. And one thing that I left. Um, thinking about, and you can respond to or talk about anything at all, um, is this notion, first of all, it's a dance that doubles itself, first of all. Yep. It's performed once, and then a separate set of dancers, correct me if I'm wrong, perform the same choreography again in the exact, with different, um, maybe there's, well, let's hold off on that for a second, and then it, it, it's doubled, so it's again the same dance, and then it ends, right? Mm -hmm. Is there any difference between the two? Lighting. Lighting, that's what I thought. Yeah. Music. Yes, um, music. And, and intention. Intention, okay. Um, 
But the thing that struck me when seeing it was this dynamic, or what I saw as a dynamic between the control of, the, the discipline of this kind of dance where you do it once and then it has to be doubled, right? Mm -hmm. Are you trying to do it perfectly, like a perfect double or not? There's like a control there and then in that moment of control, there's also this infinite possibilities. Every possible mistake or difference is a new thing and you see it as a new thing, do you know what I mean, in the audience. And I just thought that dynamic between control and, I don't know, I don't want to say like freedom, I want to say like um, chance maybe or something like that. I mean, I would say it's a definite, I would, um, control, control, maybe that's wrong, control's yeah. a funny word. I would say, um, so it's two casts of five, and the first cast is this, it's, it's this beautiful music, it's this blue backdrop, um, that's in front of this uh, metallic cube, and um, the dancers do this be beautiful, be beautiful dance, and then, yeah, um, slowly at the end of this first section, the light starts to dim, and then the five dancers leave, and a new cast of five comes out, and the same choreography, but right out of the get-go, because of the music and the lighting, you know you're in a different yeah. side of the world. Um, sunrise and sunset, the sense of, and then at the very, very end, the five dancers who started come back out, and there's this sense of like dawn again. So, cycle. Cycle. And I think in terms of the dancers who do the same part do talk, they do collaborate. There is a focus on the specificity of it. Intentions do vary. The musicality is also different, which affects how you jump because yep. gravity is fairly consistent. Um, unless you're on a cruise ship, in which case you don't quite know where the floor is going to be, but usually gravity is pretty solid. Um, so we'll collaborate on intention um, and musicality and choices, but where, where it's fascinating to play with and look at as artistic director is this notion of what does the square, yeah. what does it represent? What does it create in terms of yeah. space and boundary? When do we, that moment that the dancers are in it for a long period of time, and when they break that wall, um, we know their space. We know that they could step over the pole and then they're outside of it. We're, that's, that's not foreign to our thinking, and yet, choreographically, it's astonishing when they do, and it's so exciting, and we hunger for it, and then we hunger for them to go back into it. Um, so Alex's ability, Alex's ability to take the center of the stage and to kind of break it and create a boundary for it, um, where it's either avoided or it's contained um, or it disappears, um, is truly extraordinary. And the costumes are hilarious because the costumes actually went through a couple versions, and. Um, started off with Alex Katz originally, and then the collaboration wasn't going very well. And there's this great story um, that Alex tells in the book about um, Paul decided to go with the costumes that you see here on the left, um, which did not have bright color or bright shapes, um, and Alex saw it. And um, Alex said, if you ever want to work with me again, you're going to burn those costumes. <laughs> and Paul Taylor, being Paul Taylor, burned them and sent him a box of ashes. And I was like, I'm ready. Um, which goes back to that conversation about like these two like healthy egos, kind of like it would be very easy, like I'm so sorry I offended you, like no, I'll burn them and here's the <laughs> remnants of what I tried to do. Um, so the costumes that then Alex made after that are what we have now. Um, but it's a beautiful work um, and it's a great dance for education as well, to, like, to really kind of break down this notion of like, how can the same thing be done, be done twice differently? And how does that make you feel? Um, so it's yeah. used for our education programming a lot. Maybe I should have said, it's about the, the presence of difference in the double, rather than yeah. control or something like that. Yeah. yeah, thank you. And you, you mentioned the cube. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, how do you, I mean, the meaning of it, and you, and you were sort of asking the question, what is that, what, how, how have you perceived that, or seen that, or worked with that, or moved with that? I, maybe it's because I worked for, Paul was not always clear about what something meant or why it was there. Um, sometimes he'd be specific about a feeling or an intention, but sometimes it was just like, this is what it is, there's a cube on stage, thank you. And you're like, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, and 
what that does, not only does it give the audience, not only do I get to tell you that I don't know what it means, um, but it gives the audience permission to actually kind of, and it goes back to like abstract art, like you get to, what does the cue mean to you? How does it make you feel? You know, but with the dancers as well, like what is the, like what is your relationship to it? Um, yeah, that, that's... It's definitely, and this goes back to a lot of the set pieces and the obstacles that Alex created, it becomes a character, just like lighting, um, that it becomes its own statement within the work. And it's not a prop or an object that's there. It is literally an anchor that drastically affects how we perceive the art. Um, but it's not my job to necessarily tell audiences or dancers what that means to me, but I can tell them how to, how we're, how to make it more successful or where we're losing magic a little bit. I love what you just said, though, that it's, it's a, it's like a lens or something, or like a, it's a character, you said, but you said it's even more than that. It's like, it's a conditioning piece of the work, yeah. I mean, and, and it's like, a, it, it multiplies the frames, doesn't it? The body that moves in and out, it's framed in we do infinite rehearse, ways. Yeah. We, we do rehearse without it, because it's, a, it's yeah. like nine feet by nine feet, it's a big, it's a big piece of uh, scenery, but um, <coughs> you don't want to rehearse without it for too long because it does change things. I mean, it is also an object that you can hit, you can trip, you can fall. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sizable obstacle. Um, but it does have a force to it. Oh, absolutely, it's almost architectural. Yeah. 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 Do you, I wanted to pause for a second here. Um, let me see what's up next. I mean, I love this installation view um, of the Colby show. I mean, good job up there. Um, that looks really good, it's beautiful. Yeah. Uh, the, I, I wanted to ask you, like, what is it like for you to see objects you've danced with or seen dancers with, or I don't want to call it an object, it's more like a lens, as you said, but to see it in a different stage, in a different context, the context of the gallery. What is that like uh, for you? Well, is I that weird? Yeah. It's different, and I think lighting is a crucial element to what the cube represents on stage and the way the cube with, with, without the proper lighting, the cube could just look like, it could look flat. Um, and I mean that in terms of color, but if it's lit well, it becomes, it almost shimmers and it glows. So without that lighting, it, it, it can be just an object or it can literally be this like illuminating like container that's on stage. So when you take things out of the environment in which they were designed for, um, it changes them. Is it better or worse? I mean, that's something, again, we could debate. Um, but I definitely love how the lighting just reflects off of it when it's on stage against a black floor, and depending on the blue or the black backdrop. Um, it's, just, it's, it's stunning by itself. It is a piece of art alone. I mean, you can have the curtain go up with no dancers, and it's just striking. And then you add the human element, and it just it elevates it. Um, the obstacle. I guess this is the one. The, the obstacles. obstacles. Yeah. Um, again, um, this is one of the works right where I thought about the relationship of the cutouts to mm -hmm. the desert. But um, what a great image of this. Um, I guess I, I, I'm, I'm just curious. You know. Why put 32 steel yeah, well, dogs on stage? <laughs> yeah, I like I like the Paul Taylor response of it's a cute, just deal with it. This is what it is. Yeah. Um, but. Um, the images of the work, when, I mean, I've never seen it performed, I don't think, um, so I only have seen images, and it makes it seem like such a playful, happy, whimsical, um, but also sort of strange place where the gazes of animals and humans and things kind of intersperse, these wide-eyed sort of dogs just staring, there's something weird about that to me. I'm always looking for the sinister side, as you can tell. Um, but. I also know that it must be difficult for a body to move amongst these. It is. It is so I'm curious. Yeah. yeah. So I think it originally started with 32 dogs on stage, and then um, there's there's great stories, and Alice talks about it, or I think Charlie Reinhardt talks about it towards the end of the book about um, after the premiere, <laughs> slowly certain dogs in certain places started to just kind of be 
<laughs> just to disappear to create an easier path for dancers. Um, but there's also a quote in the book where um, Alex has all these dogs like all over the stage and the composer Don York who created this beautiful score, he was our music director for a number of years, um, was thinking slow, lush, and there's a slow section in it, but like very relaxed and safe. And Paul's like, no, <laughs> like, it's gonna be an athletic adventure. Like they're gonna be running and jumping and that's part of the excitement. It's like, how are the dancers navigating this? Um, and they do, and it's, it's an audience favorite. Children love it. Um, it is surreal and it's kind of, not only are there dogs, there's a giant cabbage that makes a random appearance um, because, <laughs> period. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful work. Um, and it gets an impression that that curtain goes up every time. And that's true with a lot of Alex's work. That curtain goes up and you just, yeah. you hear 2,500 people just go like, ah. Oh. And then again with lighting too, like the moments that like, you recognize it as a set, but then the lighting moments where the dogs become characters. Yeah, totally. In it. Yeah. Um, it's great. And, yeah. then, and then Paul also has the dancers at one point, the very, very end at this like apex of musical genius, the dog, the uh, dancers start barking um, as well. And it's just this, it, it, it doesn't care about the whimsy of it and it kind of embraces it and it's heartwarming. I love what you said that the dogs become almost animate, you know? That happens a yeah. lot in some the of Dancers these. acknowledge it, you know, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's a real, it's a character. Yeah, it's not just a prop. It's a good way to think of the dances and Alex Katz's work, I think, a lot. And, 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 all of their work. Um, okay, so you, you, you um, um, I, I, I want to just talk about two more dances and then I want to hear, curious what, if anyone has any questions or things to add. Um, but uh, I just, we spoke briefly before this talk and I, um, we brought, we mentioned Sunset and just how this is one of those, it's one of those dances, at least for me, that I had that exact experience. The curtain goes up, or, and I had this, I don't know, very emotional experience with this dance. Not a dance that I was expecting to be super into, to be frank. I was there to see Polaris, and, and this dance really got me. Um, and um, I think it might have been the loons, um, as I mentioned, that something about that sound um, that comes in halfway through, right? But um, I, I don't have much, anything sort of intellectual to say about it other than it was, it, it did it did something and I just wanted yeah, to share so, that. Yeah, um, so Alex was in Madrid and he was um, in a park and he saw soldiers on leave and they were, they were socializing with, with some young women and then they ended up parting ways and that visual, um, he actually painted it before Sunset was choreographed and he went to Paul with this idea and what makes there's a couple things that make Sunset very, very important, I think, within the canon of modern dance, to be frankly. One, uh, to, to be frank, one is that um, Alex gets rid of a third of the entire stage. So normally in a theater, there are wings where you can exit on one side or the other. And he basically puts up this giant wall that inhibits anyone from exiting. It kind of goes back to the Red Room, this like, whole notion of like we're going to block off entrances and exits. So people can only come on from one, um, one side of the stage. So this giant wall and the backdrop are painted by Alex. Um, and it's a story about soldiers who are on leave and they meet and mingle with these four beautiful women. And it goes from romance to, to this beautiful Elgar music. Um, and then it goes to this loon call sequence where each of these relationships kind of emerges. And we enter this world of where romance and innocence starts to be weighed down, I think, by the weight of goodbye or the weight of the reality of love departing. There's a lot of ways you can look at it. Um, but the gestures change, the relationship between the dancers change across all of the actual, across all of the actual genders of who's performing the work. Um, the men between the men, the women between the women. And then the ending is this, this somber kind of farewell and the men leave the women behind. And um, what's poignant about the departure is the men are wearing these red, um, these red caps and 
one soldier at the prayer again drops their their um, beret. It's a hard word for me to say. Beret um, on the floor, and one of the women runs, and she reaches down, and she hesitates, and she picks it up, and she looks back at the women, and the curtain comes down, and. That work, the combination of the Elgar, the Loons, Cats, Jennifer Tipton, Paul Taylor, it, it cemented Paul as one of the great war poets of history. Um, and it's an astoundingly emotional work to perform. There's only two dances in the repertory that I've cried performing, and this is one. And talk about being in the world where something, it, it's, it's hard to describe, spiritual, magical, I don't know what you want to call it, but the world takes over and it becomes very real. And all of a sudden, like, it, it, I don't know how to describe it. And that doesn't, that only happens when collaborations are at their, like, apex. Speaking, speaking of that, and, and this is, and we'll end with this, but I want to make sure we format it, because you mentioned being in the world of Last Look as yep. well. And, and um, I love the way you say it and you speak of it. And, and, and having seen it, I, I, I think I know what you mean. There is this, it's another world that's created. It begins and then it ends and you see the whole cycle. It begins where it is. The bodies emerge from this mass, right? Heap, and then they flail about gestures that seem like they once communicated something, but no longer do, um, right? Does that make sense? And, and some of them are like, you know, banal gestures, some, and some are dancerly gestures, but they are fragmented, and then they just, the bodies descend back into this heap, and it ends amidst these weird mylar-coated columns, and there's the Colby show with the reconstruction, I believe it's a reconstruction, it must be a reconstruction. Yeah. Um, I, I, this is, I don't know, this is probably the dance that um, I think most about when I think about the collaboration. It's also one of the, definitely the creepiest, and it's almost apocalyptic. It say. is apocalyptic, and I would say that um, there's an element, there's a, there's a definitely an essay to be written about the relationship between Scudarama from 1963 and Last Look from 1985, and kind of what this notion of Armageddon, this notion of humanity collapsing, and the, how the human body fights for its survival within that world, and Last Look, the two are incredible, but last look, I think, in terms of the collaboration between Alex and Jennifer and Don York and Paul, this this works is just extraordinary. Um, Alex's use of color, the use of, um, the women are wearing bangles, um, I forget what he called. I think he called them like ice or something. Not it's ice. Like flashy, um, uh, there's, a, there's a word he, it's oh like a, God. it's a big gaudy and yeah, he um, used a phrase, it was a very like specific mid-century way of describing like jewelry. Lip. They're not elegant. Like lip. Like, <coughs> yeah, something lip. like that, yeah. Real like mm -hmm. lip. Glitz. 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 Um, it's, it, and so you get these flashes of like color and it light and it's, in, it's incredibly violent. And the dancers love doing it. Um, <laughs> And I think as as much as Sunset creates a world that you can dance in and experience and Sunset kind of takes over, um, Last Look, I only understudied it, I never performed it, and there are people in this room um, who have performed it. Um, that curtain goes up and you're in this pile of bodies and it's kind of like, how they've described it, it's like 20 minutes just happens and then the curtain comes down. Like the world just emerges and things happen and it just sucks you back down. Um, and it takes the audience with them. I mean, you are affected. Um, and it's on the spectrum of light to dark, it's certainly on the far, far spectrum of dark, but no less genius um, in its interdisciplinary collaboration. Which is also, I think, and there's something about this that Alex was painting this and continues to paint it. He actually just painted our dancers in these costumes. Oh my God, like eight or eight months ago maybe or so. Um, this dance for him also holds some artistic curiosity that hasn't been stated yet. He still wants to paint it. He still wants to photograph dancers in it. Um, 
we're going to be bringing it backstage to Lincoln Center, and like, like, like he wants to. There's something about it as a piece that represents something to him, and I think that's all, that. That also speaks to the power of the art, not just the people making it. Wonderful. Yeah, I think that's a great way point to turn it out to the audience to see if you have anything to add or ask. Thank you, Michael. Yeah. If you have a question, just raise your hand. We only have time for a few, so. Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah, sure. Hi. Appreciate the talk. Um, I want to just see if we can talk more about this idea of world building in dance, because, uh, you know, painting, and you know, especially figurative painting, is really about kind of painting the world, and frame really is historically a window into a new space, and we talk a lot about framing. Um, dance is something I'm much more unfamiliar with, and just want to get an idea of like what separates a dance that's not able to successfully make a world mm. and a dance that does it so incredibly well like last night and, mm. and um, like the world piece you talked about. Thank you. Great question. What makes it successful and transformative? I think, whew. Um, I'm gonna have to think on that actually. I, I think there's I think there's an element of craft that has to happen from every front, like a refinement of when less is less and when more is more, um, when to edit. I think that's something, and they talk about this a lot, that like, um, I know last book, the mirrors and the lighting um, were positioned differently at the premiere, and then things were adjusted. Um, accordingly from that, with Polaris, the costume, like this, this, this notion of not having hit it quite out of the park yet. Um, so the ability to take the time to refine is something that I think in a capitalist world of like, we need more time to actually figure out how to make this better. We don't have the time, we don't have the money, this is what it is. Um, so I think time, the luxury of money, I think can certainly translate to like refining a theatrical element. Um, I think, it's certainly trust among collaborators. I think the dancers, the performers' ability to let the world inform what they're doing, I think is important for me as a director, rather than just performing, these are the steps, these are the counts, this is correct, this is what it is, rather than letting all these other pieces of art kind of seep into their bones and let that change things, and then having the people from the outside who let that happen. Like, yeah, that's a little different, but okay, like, like what does that mean? So it is a living thing. I think the moment you start, this has to be the way it is, this has to be, like, like this person did it this way, this is what it is, this is the, like, the moment you start inhibiting individuality from kind of shining, I think pieces can become stale. Um, so how do you create freedom in interpretation, but also respect the universe that's being made? Um, it's probably more a question about legacy preservation than it is creation. Um, but I don't create art, I'm the legacy <laughs> curator, so it's where my brain is at. That, that really helps though. I mean, before we got on stage, you said, if I'm remembering correctly, you said something about Last Look where like they're in this, you said it just now, like the, the dance begins and then it ends and like, what, where was I? I was in some alien world for a minute. Um, but when you're in the world, you were saying something about like, you have to make decisions in the moment that change the dance microscopically, but the world tells, makes you change or make, makes you make a decision in the moment. It's sort of what you just said, that it lives. It's a, it's, it, as you said, it's a living thing. Yeah, yeah. Art is a living thing. So um, things happen. Even it's a live performance, and I think that's another thing that I think respecting the power of live performance as a real, tangible, evolving, minute-to-minute -minute moment, and respecting that in the momentness rather than like what it should be or what's in my head is what it has to be. And you do need that at times. You need that specificity. Um, for even just safety reasons alone when it comes to partnering and things like that. But art has a power of its own and it's to be respected, not like regimented, I think.
Yes. I'm curious, uh, um, as artistic director, are you there to uh, just curate Paul's work, or will you be creating a, a piece for the company yourself? I have choreographed enough to know that I don't want to choreograph. <laughs> Okay. Um, I think I have in the past, I've enjoyed it. I don't have a deeply rooted passion for it. Um, and the position that I'm in, I feel that there are so many other people out there who deep down in their bones are like, I'm here to make dances. Like it's, it's, it is what I do. Yeah. Um, I think of myself as, you talk about that like, that intangible, like, I see myself as like a protector and maintaining that live, perf like, what is the magic? Where are we deviating from letting art do what art's supposed to do? Um, and kind of steering the ship in, in that way and also programming in a way that responds to the times that we're in right now, you know, which can be comforting, which can be provoking, um, but also creating a company that respects the community that they're in, but the power of the art form that they're involved in. Um, the art is bigger than any of us, and if I do my job, it'll be here longer than any of us, you know? Um, and it's bringing, who, who is the next Paul Taylor? Who is the next Alex Katz, you know? Um, where can these collaborations, where are they now? Um, or how can I, start creating them now so that in you know 20 30 years we have a last look that speaks to the 21st century not just the 20th um, and I, wait, so but to your point I mean you do have a creative role in determining when to bring it it's very back. creative yes and and what bringing last look was there what was your thinking to bring this back now was it, did you feel it was becoming resonant today well, it's, really, it's interesting because I do think a lot of dances that either are from the 1960s or invoked the 1960s are having particular resonance right now. And I've been watching that happen or the 80s. through education, actually. Like dancers in school um, are enjoying the movement style that emerged from the 1960s, which I just find fascinating. Um, so history, I think, does repeat itself. I think there are these universal themes that kind of emerge every, you know, hundred years or so. Um, I think, I think the notion of a world that's fragmented, that is ending, and humanity trying to wrestle with itself, and also with the mirrors and like reflections of, you know, who are you? What are you doing? What do you like? It, I, I think we need to see art that has that on. Stage, not hide it. Um, we need beauty. We need to, we need escapism. Um, I tend to refer to Paul's repertory right now in three different boxes of things. There, there's a there's a blanket. We have a repertory that's a blanket that's comforting and soothing and just kind of wraps you up and just makes you feel good. Um, there's a repertory that's a window a window into a whole new world that's entirely fantastical, it can be surreal, like diggity, um, that is unimaginable. Um, but it's definitely a different world that's not necessarily grounded in any reality that we know. And then there's a mirror, and it's a repertory that holds a mirror up to our society and our culture and says, look at yourself. Um, and Paul's work can sometimes exist in all three simultaneously. Um, and ironically, even with the mirror, um, it does give this lens kind of not just back to the dancers about what they're performing, but it gives the audience that sense of back, like, like what, does you, what is your reflection in the world? Um, Are we just all images, fleeting, <laughs> dancing, wearing fashion, wearing gorgeous <laughs> bright colors? I mean, Kat says some great statements that, about fashion, I mean, I always saw this as about fashion. It's a look. It's the last look. You know, it's an incredible. But it's yeah. it's it's women and, and men and these. Well, they're wearing like work suits. The men, mm -hmm. right? And, but the women have these sort of flashy dresses, and it's like he says something about fashion having no truth, that it's actually empty, and that's why he loves it. And mm -hmm. I think that there's something happening in last look. But and, and I don't mean that in like a bad. In, I mean that as maybe that's a generative thing. But anyway. I, I wanted to just say that. 
It's an incredible work. Okay. And, and, I mean, and uh, frankly, there's a number of, you'll see within the book, um, there's a number of paintings and commentary from, from 1985. And then as you get to the back of the book, you'll see paintings from 2022 um, of the current company um, as well, highlighting that. Any last question? Oh, we're done. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.